are pretty on Ulysses. There it is. Well, hello, BookTube. I'm Sean the Book Maniac. Welcome back to my channel and welcome to another Friday Reads. It's probably warm enough to go outside, but I just don't quite have the, <laughs> the wherewithal to get myself organized. It's going to be a short one in terms of what I have to say, so I'm going to do a lot of shouting out at the end. So, um, and so why don't I start with a little personal story. It's not really a story, but uh, uh, the bane of my existence, which is... Um, I would do more filming in more locations in my house. For example, I would make cooking videos or I would, you know, place the camera in other areas, but I don't want you to see how disgustingly untidy and, in fact, dirty certain areas of the house are. Kenji and I are both slobs. I married the one man in Japan who's not a neat freak, and I have been a slob all my life. <sighs> so, um... We never clean. I mean, before the pandemic, we used to clean when we were having house guests. But we haven't had any house guests for, what is it, two years? I don't remember how long, but uh, since whenever the pandemic began. So since the pandemic, we have done one complete cleaning. And I'm not talking about house cleaning where you clean out your closets and sweep under the bed. And we never do that. But just a thorough cleaning, vacuuming, cleaning the bathroom, cleaning the shower room, cleaning the kitchen floor and counter. We've done that exactly one time since the pandemic started. <laughs> so now with people getting fully vaccinated and the numbers of coronavirus are so low right now, but I think they will be high again within a couple of months because apparently we're about a month or two months behind Europe typically. Oh joy, oh bliss. So we might start having house guests again. I have been trying to train Kenji. Well, it, I, it's easy for me to blame Kenji, but in fact I've been trying to train myself to micro clean which if i understand if i'm using the term correctly the meaning i think is clear just do a little bit of cleaning not maybe necessarily every day but twice a week do 15 minutes of cleaning if both of us did 15 minutes a day of cleaning once a week twice a week the place would be a lot in a lot better shape than it is now <laughs> Right now, oh my god, if somebody stopped by unannounced, which, you know, never happens, thank god, um, they would have to, <laughs> they'd have to go somewhere else to use the toilet, so, no. Ah, so, I think I've got Kenji roped into this experiment in habit formation this weekend, and now he tells me he's going out of town overnight Saturday, so I'm not sure how it's going to work, but I have committed to doing three 15-minute clean cleaning sessions starting today and that I've asked him to commit to two so I think he can still do two he has a really he has a knack for agreeing to do something and then completely forgetting that he's agreed or that I've even mentioned it to him so we'll see how it goes but uh, <laughs> that's on my that's on my list today well Sean's doing some micro cleaning here's the weekend review God, I can't believe how deeply I am going into this woman's psyche as she is having breakdown after breakdown and marriage breakdown, marital breakdown episode after marital breakdown episode. And I am laughing and I am horrified at the same time. Die, my love. It's all there in the title. It's a little dark. There's the driver's seat by Muriel Spark. Um, uh, <laughs> pretty unsettling but also breezy uh, I just love her style um, that one's about a woman who goes off on a holiday and um, things take a turn for the dark <laughs> yes it's actually downright disturbing that one but so great what is a tittle you ask it's a superscript dot, like the one over a small I or a small J. That's a tittle. Are you feeling titillated? No connection, by the way. <laughs> they, they sleep in the so same yes. bed, but uh, he says good night. She says good night to you too. They both turn to the uh, to the other side, and that's it. But somewhere in that moment, uh, somewhere in a, uh, when they were at home, uh, she sees him smoking a pipe. And she, I think she finds that attractive. I think because before, because of that, she asks him, "What do you do at a brothel?" 
what happens at a brothel. And he tells her, and he says, oh, you don't have to go to the brothel anymore. I will do those things for you. <laughs> <laughs> wow, Freud would have a field day with this. So I've had a really good reading week. I have stuff to finish. I finished stuff, and probably my Friday reads might be shorter till the end of the year because I don't think I'm going to start very much more. It will be a huge accomplishment for me to finish up everything that I'm currently reading by the end of this year, especially since I'm going home for Christmas for two weeks. But I will be starting a little bit of stuff. So we'll get to all that. I have finished three. A lot of the books I'm going to talk about today, I have Zoom chats, which will be coming. So it's not like there's an embargo necessarily, but I don't want to kind of preempt that. For example, the first book I finished this week, it was The Stone Face by William Gardner Smith, reissued by NYRB Books, and Dan, of formerly of the Weird Book Book Club, and I had a great chat about it last Saturday. I, I won't keep it a huge secret, but it, it was a four-star read for me. It was a really, um, it was more interesting than it was good, but it was good. Uh, it wasn't an excellent novel, but it was a fascinating novel and a fascinating story all about race and racism, um, and we had a really interesting chat. I don't know how soon that chat will go up, but I may go up in the next week. So I would recommend this. It's not a brilliant work of literature as much as it is a brilliant fictional anatomy of racism that I, it was in a period of time. It was written in about 1960 and set in France, but with broad implications for the present day. So stay tuned for that. And this was also a four-star read, but mainly because it's a middle-grade novel, and, you know, I didn't love it the way I would if I was a middle-grade student, but I did still love it. Fatty Legs by uh, Margaret Uliman Pokiak Fenton and her daughter-in-law, Christy Jordan Fenton, with illustrations by Liz Amini Holmes. Well, it's the true story of Margaret Uliman, who was an Inuvalik girl who begged her father way up north in Canada in the, I'm not sure which decade, decades and decades ago, to please let her go to residential school. And she talked him into it against his better judgment, and she had a terrible time. And that's what the story's about. I think it's a marvelous introduction for children of this age to a very important issue in Canada's history. And the writing was to die for. Christy Jordan Fenton, I think, did, I don't know if she did most of the writing, but uh, she is a literary talent to watch. Stay tuned for her appearance on my Bite Size Book Chats. Maybe next week, I'm not sure, but very soon. And I'm going to be hounding her to write more because she is a gifted prose stylist. This was a, a, a really moving with... Uh, with great illustrations and, uh, you know, a really heart-rending heart story. So, Fatty Lakes, I recommend it. Okay, well, I am redoing the rest of this video. It is now 4 p.m., and I got eight minutes into the video in terms of editing, and I was really pleased with the audio quality, and I was an effort somewhat effervescent, and just thought, oh, this is going to be one of my better Friday reads. And then suddenly... And I'll play you a, a moment, a, a, a short excerpt. And here it is. The Maria Campbell memoir, Half-Breed. And uh, so she's a Métis writer. In I wrote this book. Métis wasn't a wide used term. My so audio started uh, failing. So it would just go really quiet so that you couldn't actually hear except for a really faint echo of what I was saying, and then it would go back up to normal, and then it would go really low again. And it didn't do that consistently, but it did it enough to spoil each and every book I talked about. Like, I, if I put patches to cover up the audio or type in the audio, it would just would have just ruined it. So I'm going to redo it, hoping that it was a one-time glitch. I, and b because just before I had lunch, I had a late lunch at about 2 p.m., I realized I forgot to talk about one book, so I plugged everything back in and talked for three or four minutes about the Australian collection of Aboriginal short stories from Tasmania, and that video, the audio was perfect. So that was made after this 30-minute video, where the audio, after at the eight-minute mark, it just started conking out episodically. So I don't know if this is a mic problem or an iPad problem. But I'm hoping it was just one of those weird 
glitches and that this video will be perfect because if I have the same trouble with this video I will just put up a, a foreshortened Friday reads because I, I can't uh, fool with it anymore the day's getting away on me here so I did a whole bunch of shout outs of other booktubers and booktube videos and I don't have time to, to redo that or now to do the editing so I'll have to defer that to another day except I'll, I'll just talk about one new channel that I want you to know about and I will carry on talking about and try to make this sound spontaneous because <laughs> I'm repeating what I said or maybe I'll say something new and interesting about Maria Campbell's I think 1973 memoir Halfbreed that was reissued in 2019 with a, a section of a chapter restored to it that the publishers in the early 70s refused to print, which was her narration of being raped as a teenager, she was 13 or 14, by cops that came to her f parents' house, her dad's house. It was a raid about illegal trapping or a moonshine or something like that, and, and they raped her in her parents' bed. It's now back in the book. So I had such immense respect for her before, and now it, that is just exponentially greater. She had such a, a terrible uh, life and was got mixed up with all kinds of problems that people that are marginalized and hated by society often find themselves in, poor, poor people, non-white people with drugs and prostitution and so on, got mixed up with some bad men of various races and had terrible struggles. And she narrates all of that, including the rape as a teenager, just very matter-of-factly. And I don't mean matter-of-fact in that way that bugs me when I read a novel or, or a memoir that talks that way. Oh, and then this happened, and then this happened. It's not just that. It is much richer. What's missing is the navel-gazing. She does not wallow or gloat, but she certainly does not wallow. And that's, I think, loving this memoir as much as I did and, and also really connecting deeply with two other memoirs. One I'm still reading, the Edna O'Brien one, and one that I read earlier this month by Jordan Abel. I can no longer say that I hate memoir. <laughs> Um, I guess I have to now say that I have chosen badly in the past because all three of these have been excellent and they've been very different one from the other. But for this one, Maria Campbell's half-breed, I would say, she's, she doesn't navel-gaze, but what she knits into the narrative are just little, uh, uh, little ob wise observations. And I could actually hear it on her voice because I did this as an audio text combo listening to the audiobook narrated by Maria Campbell while reading the ebook. It was interesting, Fraser Simons, a new channel that you should all be checking out, um, he liked the book, didn't like the audio narration, and I loved the audio narration and thought it really added to the book, but different strokes for different folks. There's just a wisdom that comes through that even in some of the darkest moments of her life, you just understand exactly, how do I put this? There's just something really healing in the most non-sentimental, truest way that I, can, that I can describe healing in this memoir. And then for her to look back at the end of, not the end of her life, but at the end of her original, her memoir that was originally published in the early 70s. I gotta check this, this is stupid. There's no reason why I can't look that up, right? <laughs> 1973, I was right, okay. There's a summing up chapter where she talks about having come through all of that and now, and at that, and by that time being a really connected member of the Western Canadian indigenous community, specifically, but also not limited to the Métis community and the literary community, artistic community, putting her family back together and just ending on a real note of grace. It was a beautiful conclusion to a really harrowing, gorgeous memoir. And then in, with the reissue, she has an afterword written from the perspective of, I guess she would have been around 80 when she wrote it as a great grandmother and uh, adding some, some more perspective. Ah, I, I just think it's, it's one of the best memoirs I've ever read. This was a buddy read with Heidi of My Reading Life and we both loved it. And here's the one that I forgot, where I did the addendum, and it didn't have the audio trouble, so here's that. I finished the uh, wonderful collection of short stories from Australia 
by an Aboriginal writer, born into this by Adam Thompson, more specifically set on and about Aboriginal people from Tasmania. And I really enjoyed it. I give it four stars. I'm really excited to see what he does next. I will be following Adam Thompson's career from here on in, because there was so much rich literary talent on display here. The stories were a little bit too simple for my taste. I expect that as he continues to write and publish that he will, if he specializes in short fiction, that his stories will become more complex and nuanced and uh, I look forward to that. But I really enjoyed them. They're really solid. There was only one that was a dud for me. The one about the, the young Aboriginal woman who worms her way into a, a white Australian guy's house under false pretenses and then coerces him into signing his house over to the Aboriginal peoples of that of the of Tasmania and it just didn't work as a story I just thought it was really bad but I, I don't want to spend I, I've I already spent more time than I wanted to on the one story I didn't like that I loved so many it's a really sizable collection 250 pages I think there was about 20 stories and I did it as an audio text combo and that really worked for me it really conveyed the anger that indigenous people feel the world over. I could have transposed so much of it into situations going on in Canada. And also with a physical backdrop that is being destroyed by white people and global warming, though that link was made very powerfully, I thought. And I just really think that Adam Thompson is a writer to watch. And I recommend this collection very highly to anyone who's in, who's interested in indigenous f fiction who's interested in short stories who's interested in australia like i say it, it, it for a debut I th it's his debut uh, i was really really impressed and so those are the ones i finished and i have started two and both of them are books one's a buddy they're both kind of like buddy reads so l let me talk about the one that i won't say very much about at all because what's kind of a buddy read with Ben of Doom Antidote. Um, after leaving Mr. McKenzie by Jean Reese, we are going to finish the novel this weekend and have a Zoom chat for publication on my channel or our channels soon thereafter. And we're going to go into that Zoom chat blind. So I'm not going to say anything. I've only read 40 pages, but it's only 160 pages or something. You will have to wait. I may talk more about it in next Friday's read, even if the video hasn't been posted once. Um, ben and I have surprised each other by our reactions. So that'll be fun. It's my first Gene Reese, and you're going to have to just wait a little while to find out what I'm what I'm thinking of it. And I am, buddy, reading this Faroese novel, The Old Man and Her Sons, by, um, I believe it's Hayen Brew. Last week I found on the internet, I found on some video about him on YouTube, and it, I thought it was a Dana... Uh, which country connect, c controls the Faroe Islands? Is it Denmark? Denmark. This video was either by a Danish speaker or maybe even a Faroese speaker, and she pronounced it Hagenbrew. The translator, who I haven't mentioned yet, from the Faroese, John F. West, in his little afterward a biograph biographical thing about, the author said it's pronounced in brackets approximately as Hay and brew. So I think I will go with what the translator says, but he says approximately. So anyway, I've only read the first chapter, and Roz and I haven't checked in yet. We're going to check in on the first half on Monday. Roz can choose to fast forward or not, but I won't say a whole lot. Other than um, I have a subscriber who, she is a animal rights, I don't know if she's a, actually an activist, but she certainly uh, has a very strong views about animal liberation and, and whatnot, animal rights, and she educates me often. I don't always agree with her, but I also don't have well-formed views, so I'm always, she makes me think about these things, and she left a comment on my Friday Reads last week that, uh, expressing her um, horror at the bloody slaughter of whales uh, on the Faroe Islands and it's built into their culture so much she is adamantly opposed to the Faroe Islands period and I don't want to say it any I think I'm sure sh her comment was much more well said than I'm uh, paraphrasing it but uh, certainly this opens with a very gory scene of the whale hunt and I just don't get that uh, fussed about violence towards animals in fiction I don't enjoy it I don't seek out books that have it but it doesn't 
trouble me the way it, it does her. So uh, I'm really glad that she is uh, keeping me on my toes or getting me to think about things. I'm uh, looking forward to talking about a that aspect of this. So this is a story, I don't know how far back in history it's set, but it's not in the, it doesn't have a feeling of being set in the present. But it opens with the whale hunt, vividly, gorily described, and there's a 71-year-old father and his middle-aged son that are taking part in it. And... They are both rendered comically. I believe I've s I've heard reference to this novel as a tragic comedy, and uh, I I'm getting a kick out of it. I'm finding it quite fascinating. I don't quite know what to make of it, and it is very much immersed in the world of whale hunting. So it would be a book that someone like Barbara or anybody else... I mean, I, I think whale hunting is bad in the present day. I don't know that it, I care about fictional characters making their livelihood from whaling set back in the past. Um, and I think Indigenous people should always be given an exemption from any of this kind of stuff. But um, like the seal hunt in, in Canada when it's Indigenous peoples. But again, people can attack me, and I'm sure you will, <laughs> if you think I'm saying stupid stuff or offensive stuff. I, I'm not well thought out on, on animal rights issues. It's not my, they're not my issues. But it's hard not to, to consider all of that while reading this book. So, Roz, we're going to have some interesting discussions about it. I'm starting one book next week. Britta and I have been buddy reading pretty much continuously for years, but we went on hiatus for a few weeks there, and we're starting up again. Our last buddy read of the year. A Canadian novel, We Jane by Amy Wall. I'm really excited about this. This was on the Giller Prize long list. It didn't make the short list. It's been shortlisted for a bunch of other prizes that I've never heard of. And it is a book that's very much about abortion in Canada, specifically Newfoundland. If it's not already clear, this is a 2021 novel, and it's a debut novel uh, about love between women, reproductive rights, rural Newfoundland, and a an brave, absolutely fierce feminism. So, is this a Brita book, or is this a Brita book? I'm really looking forward to buddy reading it with her. And... The author, Amy Wall, she's a Newfoundland native, a writer and a translator. She has translated French writers, whether they be French-Canadian or French-French, I don't know. I don't recognize their names. I'll look into her translating career later, but Amy Wall, Newfoundland native, lives in Montreal, and this is her first novel. Very excited to be starting it. It's probably one of the very last novels I will start and or finish in 2021. So, I am sad that I talked for a good 10 minutes shouting out various booktubers and various videos, and I just don't have time now to, to redo it and edit it before my, I have to get started, get on with my evening. I do want to shout out one, a new, to, a new and new to me booktuber from Nigeria. Her name is Caddy, and her channel is Caddy Books. I will link her in the show notes. Her, I watched her booktube newbie, newbie tag. I never watch booktube newbie tags, and I'm glad that this one showed up on my main page because I really enjoyed it. She's a fascinating woman involved in all kinds of fascinating projects, literary and otherwise. Watch that newbie tag video of hers, and you must subscribe. And I, I, I'm not aware of any other Nigerian booktubers. If you are... You can't put a link in the comment section because YouTube will delete it, but at least tell me the channel names in, or if you have a way to get a hold of me privately, you can send me the link. But I, she's the, the first that I'm aware of. Nigerian booktuber, so, and she is fantastic. Please check her out. And now, I hope to hell that this audio worked and that you're going to get to see a mishmash of the original video the supplementary video, and now this redo of the last two-thirds of the video, which will be a lot shorter than it was. So you've won in the end. <laughs> Thanks for watching. Oh.